end of the last school year, uh, when he came to me, he had never had counseling before, had never really been diagnosed with anything. And as I met with him, um, you know, I could tell he was a very bright kid. Um, but as I observed him, I started noticing um, some possible autistic-like features, uh, especially with the stimming. Um, that's what I, I noticed mostly. And the other thing that I would notice is that he had a very difficult time um, explaining situations. So most of the time I would have his mom in the session with us um, so that she could describe what was going on. Um, then, of course, there were obvious obsessive compulsive behaviors going on. And I thought, okay, I, I think I need, um, you know, a psychological done on this child so that I can kind of understand, you know, are, are we dealing with autism? Are we talk, or do we have some OCD? Is there a combination of the two? And she agreed to go to a psychologist, I believe, up in Huntington. And um, so we got the psychological back pretty quickly, and I had the diagnosis on there. Um, he did receive an autism spectrum disorder level one uh, without any accompanying intellectual impairment, and uh, of course the OCD uh, with poor insight, which I definitely um, uh, was seeing that within our sessions. Uh, so mostly what I started out working with him on are, are uh, some relaxation, uh, some focused breathing. Even that became difficult for him to do, um, especially if his mother got involved because she was real adamant about him doing it and he would uh, start to just uh, have a, 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 a mental uh, breakdown basically. So the two of them together, there were some issues there that I'm still trying to work on. Um, so I have here in the behavioral assessment some of the, the things that have uh, been coming up for him. And um, so I think the most difficult issue is when he just refuses to eat because he is afraid that he's going to be poisoned or the food is contaminated in some way. This happens mostly at school. Um, his, he and his dad both watch YouTube videos and they're, they have uh, more, they, they watch the more scientific oriented ones. So his dad was letting him check out one about asteroids and then all of a sudden he, you know, feared that an asteroid was going to hit the earth. And, um, and so he starts to obsess over things that he um, dis has discussions with, with his father. Um, and so this started about a year ago uh, for this patient. And, um, and I guess the mom and dad were basically just trying to deal with it the best they could. They thought it was attention seeking. They weren't sure. Um, but I've seen him walk backwards into rooms before and he won't touch anything. Uh, he he kind of keeps his hands to himself and, and he then he does a lot of the stemming. Um, so, so some of the research I've done uh, is telling me that traditional CBT doesn't always work for kids who have this combination of diagnoses. So uh, part of the reason why I was really, what I was really hoping for uh, uh, today is to kind of get some feedback, some uh, possible uh, things that I could approach with this kid and, um, and his mother as well. Since I'm gonna, oh, and he's not on any medication, but the mother, the mother wants to uh, consider that. So I think since it kind of fits with the didactic, why don't we switch? Why don't you do therapy first, and then I'll do. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If y'all want to do the therapy session part yeah. first, and then I'll do the medication part. What? Where do you think?
think he's functioning cognitively. <coughs> you think he's functioning at a 10 year old? Um, I would say a little above that in certain ways, but socially definitely below that. Okay. So his, his, when you talk about his thought process and poor insight, can um, you give me an example of that? His poor insight? Oh, I can ask him pretty directly, um, you know, how he, uh, about like specific emotions, and he has a very difficult time describing what that emotion feels like to him, what it feels like in his body, uh, how he might express that. He, he usually will just start stimming and say things like, uh, I don't know, and then he'll look to his mom for the answer. And so does he have insight on some of his behaviors? Yes, he does. Okay. And actually when we discuss that, um, he will again look at his mother uh, and she will describe it for him because he has a difficult time describing what that's like when sorry when he's when she starts describing it they kind of you know they kind of laugh at about it a little bit um, they uh, you know so she's trying to lighten the mood with him basically so one of the, I, you know, you're absolutely right. And so a lot of the times with kids who have a combination who are on the autism spectrum, and then they also have obsessive thoughts, which it's kind of interesting because those run hand in hand. Right? Um, one of the things, one of the approaches that I take is the family approach. And it sounds like that's something you've been doing, but it sounds like it could be a little bit difficult. Um, it sounds like their relationship is a little conflictual between him and mom. Um, so many of the times what I'll do is I'll meet with the parents alone and I'll teach them the CBT techniques so that they can help their child with those techniques. Because the, the barrier for children who are on the autism spectrum is they don't have, because they're unable to identify those emotions, they don't have the capability to understand the thoughts that are going on at that moment in time, right? That control those emotions. So they can't trigger to identify those pieces. They can usually identify the physical component that they're feeling, but not the emotional component. And so um, teaching the parents to start to identify what that physical trigger is kids on the autism spectrum are more likely to identify that physical component so that they can start to intervene at that time. Um, but you can work with the parents on that process. That's really helpful. The other piece is to help establish effective limits and routines. If we can rein that in, because many of the times um, for kids who are on the autism spectrum, they also have a, a difficult time dysregulating. And so they lose control of those emotions. And, um, you know, keeping that, those effective limits kind of, kind of compartmentalizes it, right? So it reigns those emotions in so that the parents can utilize that CBT technique. So they can memorize pieces and that's why behavioral approaches helps. Um, they're really great at memorizing pieces. And so they know what behaviors link to what consequences. So that helps them keep control and regulate their moods. And then if you teach the parent the CBT techniques to come in and then discuss and talk about, okay, so what was going on with you at that time, like physically, and then move to emotion, emotionally once you work on, it sounds like some emotion identification is necessary prior to him really identifying some of those emotions. So working on that simultaneously while you're working with the parent, so it's like a parallel process. You're working with the parent on the CBT techniques and then you're working with the child on emotional identification so that when the two come together, they're really successful with it. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's been really helpful for me. I don't know if you have, Cassie, anything regarding obsessive thoughts that would help in this case? Or Probably not any more than you've already said. I'm more used to working with adults and not, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I don't have any experience working kind of with the autism spectrum, yeah. so that's gonna be more your area right. than mine, yeah. Yeah, that throws a little curveball. so. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna, gonna understand that. my expertise, so I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. 
Yeah, there's, uh, that's throwing me quite a curveball too. So um, uh, I have a couple of uh, patients here that are on the autism spectrum, but other than that, I mean, that's pretty much it. And this one has, uh, this child has a lot more complicated issues going on um, uh, than the other kid that I work with. He has more anxiety issues and peer issues, but this kid, you know, with the OCD and, um, uh, and the, the parents have never really identified any kind of autism features until I came into the situation. So I, you know, I did observe those, mm -hmm. uh, but I, it wasn't conclusive to me at that point. Um, but uh, so, so those, uh, I think those two things would work well. Um, you know, they, they do have a good relationship, but I think the mom just gets very, a little irritable about, you know, when he, the OCD part of it mostly. Um, and then the dad takes this, I mean, he has the idea that, oh, he'll be fine, you know. Uh, so he doesn't take it too seriously, and she takes it extremely seriously. So, um, uh, and, and then the, the, the boy is just, uh, you know, kind of in the middle of all that. Does, I mean, does he seem distressed by it? Uh, I he doesn't so I don't think he does but then uh, I, I don't know about the classroom his mom brings him from another area of the county she picks him up at the end of his day I work mostly with middle and high school but he comes from an elementary in another part of the county so I don't really have access to any of the teachers there or anything like that to really know I know that it can be difficult for him at lunchtime uh, and uh, she did say some of the his peers were starting to notice that he had some, you know, odd behaviors. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I mean, if it's not impaired, I mean, it sounds like the eating piece is, is, is where the impairment is, and so really focusing his obsessions around that, and I think that that would be, you know, the place to start, but I, you know, a lot of the times with parents too, I, I, I have them check in with themselves. So like you're saying, mom gets really irritable and definitely could heighten some of um, his anxiety and his ir irritability as well. So, you know, having her check in with herself and a lot of the times I'll do mindful techniques with parents so that they're in a neutral space when they go to approach and assist with these, with these techniques. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is kind of interesting. Again, this is definitely outside my area of work with adults, but I mean, was he, how was he doing in school before this diagnosis and everything, yeah. you know? Because this could, I mean, I don't know if he could get additional help and stuff with this and how the OCD could impact, you know what I'm saying, his performance in school. And I mean, he definitely could get some assistance and yeah, I, I think it's really interesting that he's gone 10 years without yeah. any type of impairment impacting any other domains of his life. So, I mean, that's, did anything happen? Was there anything, you know, any? I, I asked about that and it's, did, uh, other, she did have a baby about a year ago and then he has a, I think a seven year old brother and the brother, he and the brother have a lot of conflict. Um, the, well, the mother describes it that way, um, uh, that the younger brother knows how to push uh, this patient's buttons, basically, mm -hmm. and uh, can make him kind of spiral uh, uh, a little bit. And uh, of course, the baby is about a year old now. Um, so that's, that's the only thing the mother and I could come up with was, you know, the only real change for this kid um, was uh, the, the baby. Uh, there's no real marital conflict uh, that she spoke of, and there were no uh, traumatic events happening at that point. So I don't know. Well, I think, though, that she, she would say that there, she, could, she noticed some anxiety with him when he was younger. Uh, and as he got to that point, but she had never noticed these uh, more obsessive traits. 
Yeah, I mean, that definitely could be the stressor. And, you know, when you talk about their interactions and how mom gets irritable, but yet she speaks for him, like, it sounds like mom is his person, right? That understands him, that can help him communicate. Um, and so, and that relates to him. And so, you know, if her attention has gone elsewhere, especially with him being on the autism spectrum, he might not fully understand that. That could definitely be the stressor. Mm -hmm. Right. Because she doesn't understand, you know, why does he keep doing this or why does he keep doing that? And so he's developed more of these, you know, patterns and she, you know, without that autism, autism diagnosis, she just wasn't relating to that at all. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as he gets older in school, she's just noticing it more. Like they put him on a little league baseball team this summer and uh, he would stand out in the field and he would be stimming and I tried to get her to understand that, but she thought, well, my husband taught him how to slick the tobacco out of his mouth and he was doing that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he would, and then he would show me what he does with his hands and it sounds like he's snapping his fingers. And she said, I don't understand why he just wants to do that all the time. And I'm like, well, you know, now that we have this diagnosis, this could be the reason. And so um, those were things that she started noticing as he got a little older. Yeah, so I, I mean, behavioral techniques work fantastically with kids who are on the autism spectrum. So that where, that's where that limit setting comes in. But you, know, you might wanna also work with her um, on planned ignoring and ignoring those behaviors because if, if the, um, the, the trigger of stress at this time was the attention that was diverted to the baby, then the attention that he's getting for his stemming behaviors are gonna definitely increase them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lisa, I want to thank you so much for presenting the case. That was excellent. I love the discussion. Dr. Goodykins is going to talk some more. Too. Well, thank you for your feedback. Thank you. You know, one of the interesting things, just to follow up before I start talking about medicine, is is that um, there there are some. You know, there is a, a component of um, autism spectrum that has kind of an obsessive. Um, kind of need for sameness and counting and things that yeah. look very much like OCD. And I've, I've certainly seen kids who had an autism diagnosis that um, also had an OCD diagnosis that I didn't really think applied. I thought it was more part of their, their autism spectrum, but certainly it's not mutually exclusive and you can have both. The, the other thing about the distress is it's amazing. Um, I actually have kind of partial care of an adolescent female who's now 16, 17 years old that has probably, and I, Dr. Ladrowski um, has the therapy portion of it, and I've had her on my inpatient unit. Um, she is probably the most impaired OCD child adolescent I've ever seen and is completely oblivious. She thinks that she just needs to do her rituals and if people will just let her do that, she is perfectly content to stay home, not go to school, avoid school, um, and just sit home and do her rituals and all this. And she's perfectly content. Um, I mean, it's amazing it, to, to see how little distress it causes her. Um, her family, however, is a complete nightmare. Um, they're just a mess over it, but that does happen. Um, what I'm going to do is, is this kind of was perfect because I was doing today's talk on child and adolescent anxiety. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and then that's going to work into OCD and the OCD medications that I'm, that I'm going to kind of mention because that's the, that's the part of that. So the first thing that I would say is, yeah, go ahead. That'll be great. That'll keep me from having to read off of it. <laughs> yeah. So with... With anxiety in general, what I would say is, is that I probably get more referrals for children with questions of anxiety than just about any other diagnosis these days. And it's been true for a while. Some people ask me, why do kids seem to have more anxious problems now? I think it's a combination of things. I think we're more aware that there is a, a, a a component of anxiety that runs in families. Whenever I've got a child that's an anxious worrier, um, I, if I go asking for other family members, the, they will be able to relate to three other members of the family that also share those same issues. 
the other thing too is is I think that kids are a lot more aware of things to worry about in the world um, we've got technology we've got TVs I mean we're in the you know the hurricanes coming and we've got nonstop 24 hour um, you know television about it and so after every significant hurricane or storm or something like that we'll have a whole group of kids have this anxiety about is a hurricane going to come to West Virginia are we going to get a tornado here um, and part of it does come from just literally the all the exposure that they have to this and it heightens anxiety in kids who may already have it what's interesting is is that when kids present they don't necessarily present obviously as anxious or anxiety little warriors some of the things that they will sometimes present to me with, and then we we end up going down the anxiety route, is that sometimes they'll come in and they will complain that they have poor attention span and they're distracted. So oftentimes that evaluation will come in via, hey, we think they have ADHD. Because when kids are worried and anxious, they're not able to pay attention. They're, they're you know, overwhelmed with those thoughts in their head. They're worrying about what if the teacher calls on me? What if I do something or say something stupid? So they're distracted and they have poor attention and that oftentimes will kick up a referral. Um, the second thing is poor comprehension for the same reasons. They're not paying attention, they're anxious, they're worried, um, or they're afraid of saying the wrong thing. So a teacher will call on them and they're so overwhelmed with anxiousness that they can't even respond about something that they probably know the answer to. Um, sometimes they will present with worry thoughts and ruminations. Um, for example, I'll get a referral from a mom who will have a child that says um, he doesn't want to go to school. He wants to stay home because he's afraid that the tornado will come to school or there'll be something on the news about a school shooting. And then I've got all kinds of kids that don't want to go to school. They want to stay home. Um, I mean, that's a natural reaction for a lot of kids, but if you have kids who already have, um, you know, an anxiety picture, that will really um, kick that into high gear. Kids who have anxiety also will worry about things like somebody's going to break into the house, somebody's going to, you know, something's going to happen to my mom. So one of the things that I always ask about is tell me about the things that you worry about. Kids who have anxiety are typically kids who had those kinds of worry thoughts for a while. And if you ask mom or dad, they'll say, oh, he's always been a worrier. He's always worried about something. So you'll get kind of a history of that. You'll get kids who have unexplained somatic complaints. Common, my tummy hurts, I have a stomach ache, I have a headache. And so one of the things that's important to remember is the, you know, think about when you're anxious or upset or worried, your stomach feels sick, your head hurts, you don't feel well. When, you know, when we've got all that anxiety unleashed in us, we don't feel well. They don't either. And so they really do feel sick to their stomach. Their stomach really does hurt. Their head really does hurt. And it's important to, to not dismiss that as being insignificant. Um, it's important to acknowledge that because they will say, it's not that I don't want to go to school, I want to go to school, but I can't because my stomach hurts so bad. So there's an unconsciousness, you know, that they're not necessarily trying to dream this up like I did when I was in junior high, and we always tried to skip school, and I had the infamous, you know, stomach ache or headache. These, these are kids who generally feel it, um, and they may actually want to go to school and be with their friends, but this is one of the things that keeps them from doing it. Other kids will get presented because the parents will say they won't go to school. They don't want to go to school. There's no explanation for it. I just don't want to go. Um, and sometimes that's because of social anxiety. Sometimes it's a fear of leaving the house. Um, those, those kinds of things can, can play a role. Sometimes I'll get kids because they're, um, they, get, they get along poorly with other kids at school. Um, either um, they're easily irritated with other kids because they get anxious and upset um, or they just have trouble playing with other people or feel intimidated. So a lot of these kids will have peer problems um, when they come in, either as a presenting issue um, or as something that naturally comes out in the conversation. Who do you, one of my questions is always, who do you eat lunch with? Um, you know, who do you sit at the table with and who do you talk to and that kind of stuff. So those all can help you come out with some of those kinds of info things. And then lastly, your separation issues. And that's just flat out. I don't, you know, I can't, you know, has always cried, 
you know, from the day they went to preschool, they stood, you know, and cried and cried and cried as the parent, you know, left and, you know, had to be brought into the class. Kids who early on have those kinds of issues and really struggle with that is also a symptom of, you know, what's going on with the anxiety. We do expect for that to lessen as they go on in school, but there's some kids that they're very persistent about that. Um, and that's, this isn't just for little kids. I recently had a 15 year old boy um, who had terrible separation anxiety. He was adopted um, by his own grandparents um, and removed and they were up in years. And then the adoptive father died, um, basically, I think he was in his 70s. And then the grandmother, who was his adoptive mom, began to have heart problems. At that point, he didn't want to leave the house. He was afraid that she would collapse or something would happen. So he just flat out did not want to go to school and got into trouble for truancy, which is how he got referred um, uh, to come see me. But his, the, the whole thing with him was he had this terrible anxiety that he was going to lose um, this one stable person in his life. Um, and, that, and that caused real problems for him. So these are just, you all can probably think of a number of different ways that kids present to you all also with anxiety. It, it always should be in your differential if you've got depression. I used to say, not every child with depression has anxiety, but every child with really terrible anxiety probably has depression. Uh, and that's something to always be thinking about as you go through it. So, the treatment is, um, is, of course, therapy, and we've talked a little bit about that. And, of course, I know that Amanda and Cassie both can talk about treatment for anxiety itself, you know, on and on and on. Um, but what I'm going to talk about are the medicines. So the first thing to remember, and I actually asked the residents this the other day. I had four of them in a room, and I asked them which of the FDA medicines were approved for treatment of anxiety in children and adolescents. And they gave me three or four names, all of them, and they were astonished. There is no FDA-approved medication for treatment of anxiety in children and adolescents. There is none. So everything that we're using, we're using, you know, because we've used it for other things or anecdotally or we've had success with it. So the real key to medication is getting the diagnosis right. It's important to avoid getting into a real problem with medicines because, let me go ahead and go to the next slide, um, because they will come in on a whole bunch of medications, um, either because they've been diagnosed with ADHD or they've been diagnosed with something else or somebody didn't know really what to prescribe, so they just started throwing medicines at them. So the list of most common medicines that you'll see used with kids who have anxiety, at the top of the list is clonidine, okay? Clonidine is a beta blocker, and it will do what to kids what it would do to us. If we took clonidine, we would feel probably a little relaxed, maybe a little sleepy, would knock me out, I would just go to sleep on the stuff, which is what a lot of kids do. It doesn't have any specific treatment whatsoever for underlying anxiety. It's just going to maybe make them a little calmer or make them sleepy. But as soon as it wears off, they're right back to what they were. And it has done nothing to treat the core problem, which is the anxiety. The same thing is true for guampacin, which is your 10x. Same thing. I see people use that as a treatment for anxiety. Um, and it doesn't really do anything, um, except there may be some calming effect, but it doesn't really treat anxiety. It doesn't get to the core of the problem. And again, it wears off and they're right back to where they started. Sometimes I'll see kids on antipsychotics. I know that's out there, but it is interesting because they will, you know, there are kids who have anxiety who will get so anxious that they'll act out because they get overwhelmed with all their thoughts or for example, and this isn't the case with the, the case that you presented today, but I've had kids whose moms were like at their wits end, stop walking backwards into the kitchen, stop washing your hands, and they get exasperated with them. And the kids in reaction to that sometimes just lose it because they're trying to do this thing that their head's telling them they need to do, which is not to touch a doorknob and not to, you know, drink after 
whoever or whatever it is. And so they're completely frustrated and they get emotionally dysregulated because they're now trying to, you know, go against these two competing things, what's in their head and what's going on with their mom. So sometimes when that ends up being more um, mood and aggression and those things, then those kids that end up on antipsychotics, okay, completely inappropriate in my opinion. Don't think that is anywhere you need to be. Um, I think you need to go to the core of the problem and absolutely is not a treatment for anxiety. The real treatment for anxiety for the vast majority of these kids and adolescents are the SSRIs and the SNRIs, okay? We don't have a specific FDA indication for them, um, but the ones that we typically use are the ones, and some of them are in the list that I have further down about OCD, but those are typically um, Prozac, uh, the fluoxetine, sertraline, which is Zoloft, um, Lexapro, um, which is s citalopram and Celexa, which is citalopram. Those are probably the leading ones that we use I'm not a fan. I see some kids on Paxil, which is paroxetine. I'm not a fan. There's people from time to time that use it, but I've seen more problems with it, and there's, a, there's weight gain issues and other things, so that is way, way, way down on the list. Some of the SNRIs that we have seen used, um, you, see, you do see venlafaxine, which is a Fexor. That is sometimes used in adolescents. Um, I'm kind of plus minus on that because there's a wear off tapering withdrawal thing with that. Um, and so that's not always a favorite. And there are some people who believe that venlafaxine really can increase suicidal thoughts in adolescents. Um, the other one is uh, Cymbalta. And um, that is one that we do sometimes use, um, particularly I have a, an adolescent girl right now. I just came from making rounds on my unit. She's presented on my unit with chronic anxiety, chronic uh, depression, and a four-year history of unexplained stomach pain um, that is chronic and completely debilitating um, and causing her to be suicidal. Um, I don't know what all she has been on, but we're going to put her on some Cymbalta. We're hoping that we can address some anxiety, maybe some of the depression, and some of the neuropathic pain that may or may not be related uh, to what's going on. Um, and she's gonna be a story in and of herself, but she is definitely, in my opinion, based upon the fact that they've done an exhaustive four-year workup, I think she is somebody who is gonna present with some uh, somatic uh, presentation of what some anxiety is. She's been bullied, as she told me, she's, since she went to preschool. So she has a long history of, of anxiety and, um, social anxiety and those kinds of things. So we're going to try her on that. But the medications of choice would be an SSRI and an SNRI. Of interesting note, I would also mention with respect to this child, we oftentimes see that children who have autism spectrum have an element of anxiety and social discomfort, um, maybe even some dysphoria and almost depressive like symptoms with some of them. They also benefit from the SSRIs, and I have used um, the fluoxetine, Prozac, and sertraline, and, and Lexapro, and Celexa for that matter, in that population as well. It does seem to lessen some of the obsessive nature of thoughts that they have, uh, also some anxiety, and it does sometimes help with dysphoria. So using those medications in a child like this will probably be a good idea. The next one is benzodiazepines. I put that in there because I can probably list on one hand the number of times I've used it in adolescence. I've never really used it in kids, but I've used it in adolescence before. And even though there's this huge, you know, um, you know, kind of, oh my gosh, you don't put them on this or that. When you have a child, a 15 year old, that is so anxious that they cannot get out of the car to even come in to see a therapist or cannot come in to see the doctor or are so anxious that you can't get any kind of medicine in or even to get them to talk to you, sometimes a low dose of a, a appropriately prescribed, regularly scheduled, never PRN, never, never, never PRN dose of a benzodiazepine, in my opinion, is appropriate. Sometimes you have to get panic and anxiety under control in order to be able to get in there and to do anything. So short-term use 
of benzodiazepines with a specific goal in mind, I think is warranted. Um, there are few and far between, but I think that when you understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, and you have a specific goal in mind and a plan for how you're going to back off of this, I believe that it has a place and it's appropriate. Um, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is OCD, which was really what this case was. Um, oftentimes when I see anxiety disorders, to me, they are almost like a grouping. I, when I see OCD, I oftentimes will see social anxiety or I'll see generalized anxiety mixed in with it. So it's, it's oftentimes that you'll see a, a mixture of it, not just the OCD. The medications that are approved by the Food and Drug Administration to treat OCD are the following that I've listed, Lexapro, Prozac, Luvox, which is fluvoxamine, Zoloft, Amipramine, which is an old, old medication, that's a tricyclic, and clomipramine, which is an afronil, which is basically an amipramine molecule with an extra hydrochloride um, uh, thing stuck on the end of that, and that's an afronil. All of these medications are approved for OCD. I've used all of them um, in some combination to treat OCD. Um, the, the dosage of them, you know, it, I'm a big believer in you start low and you go up. One of the things that the girl that I was talking about a minute ago, who's just kind of adapted to her OCD and is perfectly content, one of her obsessions is, we had her on Zoloft, and one of her obsessions is she can't take medicine. There's, a, there's something about medicine. It will poison her. She has some obsessive thought about it. So now we can't even get medicine. Hit and miss, we'll get it in for maybe a week and then she'll stop it again. So, you know, we were having a discussion the other day. Is she a medication failure? In my book, she is because I can't get medicine in her. There, you know, it's part of the whole problem. So I don't know how we would ever get medicine in her, you know, as we're looking at some other possibilities. But I generally start with a low dose. Um, and there's no specific order. In my personal opinion, I probably start with Prozac. I may go to uh, Lexapro, uh, Luvox. You could try all of them, um, and, but those are probably the ones that I start with first. In this child, um, since he's a 10-year-old and he's got um, the autism spectrum, my recommendation, I'd start with Prozac. I'd give him a low dose of it. If his mom has concerns about how it may work with him, I'd give him five milligrams. The, the thing that I always keep in mind is, is that it may not be enough for them to see an immediate response, but if you can get a medicine in him and he doesn't have an adverse response, you're way ahead of the game. So, you know, you can always say, hey, we're starting slow, we're gonna work towards that, but if you get some major side effects from a higher dose. I've seen people start off on 20, then they get a side effects, then the parents just say, no, 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 we gotta take them off of it, or the kids don't wanna take it. So I start uh, low and, and move up. There's guidelines um, for all the medications, but probably in my, in, in my practice, I would use the top four. Um, remembering, of course, that your tricyclics um, needed to be secured because of the potential um, of lethal overdose uh, of those medications. But they're certainly used and they're certainly approved by the FDA. Any questions that for discussion? Uh, hold on a second. We can't hear Jennifer now. Lisa, Jennifer, and Terry. No, I'm sorry. I don't know why. It's so weird. But I'm going to ask your question anyway. Is there an increased risk of suicidal ideation with SSRIs? How great is it and how would you monitor for that? Okay, so the answer is if you look at the SSRIs, Prozac, Zoloft, all of them, there's a black box warning um, because there is, you know, um, that's, that is a, a potential. So what I tell everybody is do, do I think, in my personal opinion, do I think that it's huge? No, but it is there for some people, and some kids have reported that they had increased agitation or thoughts. I had a little boy that I just discharged from inpatient down in Clarksburg 
little 10 year old who has terrible um, social anxiety, living with grandparents, being removed from neglect and abuse. He has real problems going to school. In fact, was on probation uh, for not going to school. Um, and he was placed on Prozac, appropriately so, by a primary care physician who placed him on 10 milligrams. He reports intense thoughts of hurting himself, killing himself, and uncharacteristically ran away. Um, so they brought him to the ER. I admitted him, and basically what I did is just let a tapering of the medication just kind of go down. He reported improvement in how he felt. He reported that the thoughts about wanting to hurt himself went away, and I discharged him on no medicine. One of the questions I was asked was, well, don't you want to try something different? Uh, no, not at the moment I don't, because I really want to make sure that he's gone down to baseline, and I want to confirm that everybody who's involved with him sees that. If I go switching him to another one, let's say I'm going to put him on Zoloft now, Let's say those things come back, okay? Is that because I put him on Zoloft? Um, or is it because they were there all along? I'm not going to know. So for the sake of trying to clear up that picture, I didn't put him on anything. Um, and I said, we're going to continue to do some therapy for anxiety. So my, my best recommendation is when you're getting ready to start putting any child on any of these medicines for whatever reason, get a good baseline picture of what their mood is like, what their thoughts of like. You know, I, I've asked, you'd be surprised. I've asked eight year olds, have you ever thought about just hurting yourself? Well, yeah, yeah, look where I cut myself the other day. Um, kids do have those things and it's important to establish a baseline. It's important to establish a baseline with the parents and to get a, you know, a buy-in from everybody that if those thoughts happen or if the parents see that, they're gonna notify me immediately. They're going to take them to the emergency room immediately. So that is your best friend in trying to kind of look at it. I, I'm hoping that you'll never see that happen. I do think it's infrequent, but because it happens, even if it only happens once or twice in my lifetime, it's going to be enough to make sure I'm asking the right questions and watching for the right things. Uh, there was one other question about high Hydroxyzine? Vistaril, hydroxyzine. Yes. So um, I should have put that on the list. I apologize. I was doing this last night after I was really tired. I apologize. Um, we do use Vistaril, the hydroxyzine, or Atarax, um, which is the same thing that comes a little bit lower dosage in 10 milligrams. I have used that if I've got a child who is in an overwhelmingly anxious situation. I've used it. I will use it with them sometimes at bedtime for sleep. Um, just like we do the clonidine. And oftentimes that's to soften some of the anxiety so that they can try to go to sleep and they can use some of the, the techniques that maybe that they've been asked to use. It is It softens symptoms, but it doesn't treat the underlying problem. And like, for example, I had an adolescent the other day who said, who came into the hospital on Vistaril 25 milligrams four times a day. And I said, is that helping you? And she said, I don't know, I'm asleep all the time. So I don't know what I feel. So, um, so you know, there, there's a place for it, but I think it's judicious use in circumstances, maybe a little bit um, at bedtime. But I think that the techniques that therapists use to help them at bedtime are way more, way, way, way more effective. Um, sometimes kids use bedtime tapes that they listen to that are, soothing and all sorts of things and I think those are always going to be preferable to medication but you can certainly use it at times. All right are there any other questions you guys? We have about nine minutes left. Okay. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you all. Um, thank you, thank Dr. Goody Coons, for the Thanks for the great case. Yes, it was a great case. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect for my didact. This is excellent. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> um, I do want to let you guys know uh, we will not be having an echo session on the October 3rd, which would be the next psychiatry meeting. All right. But if you guys have any cases you want to discuss, just feel free to send them in. I'll make sure they get seen. All right. See you guys later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.